What I mostly see and where I struggle is owners who use the first person singular too much. Hmm. They think it's about me and I, and their coworkers see that it's about me and I when, when he or she talks. And I think that that's a problem. You know, for some, not so much, and that's great. And, but oftentimes, it's hard to keep good coworkers when they don't see a future or, or they don't see themselves in the picture. Hey guys, Todd here from Construction Leading Edge. Got a great interview for you today that I just finished up recording. This is with Jonathan Orpen. He is the CEO of a couple of businesses, New Energy Works, Pioneer Millworks. All total, they have about 160 employees. So what you're going to learn about is how Jonathan started the businesses. And then he has since moved out of the ownership role into the CEO role and transitioned his companies into an ESOP, which is an employee stock ownership plan. He'll talk about some of the the benefits of that, why he did it, why he chose that vehicle, some of the, the obstacles and things to watch out for, some of the things you need to watch out for as you think about succession planning or if you haven't thought about succession planning, it's probably time to start doing that. And he talks about the concept of what a triple bottom line is for his business. So this is great stuff. Jonathan's been a business owner and a CEO for 30 years. He's grown several successful businesses, lots and lots of gold nuggets of wisdom in here. So let's get to it. Here's my interview with Jonathan Orpen. Enjoy. Jonathan, welcome to the podcast. So thanks for joining us today. Let's let's jump into it. We're going to talk about your businesses, multiple businesses, how you got started, and then the uh, the approach you took to succession planning. But first of all, let's let's talk about your businesses. What tell us a little bit about the businesses that you are you're part of. Sure, sure thing. They really all stem from the same uh, seed, which is uh, high craft, high performance, and um, sort of that custom woodworking home building mentality that my guess is uh, many of your listeners share. So uh, we started off years and years ago uh, interested in figuring out a way to uh, help planetary issues. Uh, I go all the way back to the OPEC embargo of the late of the early 80s and uh, and it changed the way people started thinking about how we should build houses. And so I was interested in energy conservation and alternative energy at the time. And in doing so, I ended up finding a way to wrap a home called the Structural Insulated Panels, which we still use somewhat, not entirely, to this day. And, and as soon as you found that, I found timber framing or heavy timber craftsmanship, uh, timber writing, and fell in love. It was just kind of love at first sight. Uh, and so what occurred to me right away was... You know, in a niche market like that, two important things would be available to me. One is special clients, because we'd all really like special clients. And the other is special coworkers. Um, you know, if you're going to spend oftentimes more time with your coworker than you do with your family uh, on a day to day business, they ought to be good people. And so if you could inspire your coworkers with great work and challenging work, it just struck me instinctively that that would be a good thing to do. So we started New Energy Works um, back in the mid-80s. And uh, then that led to a couple of other businesses, all under the same and all still running. You know, some people say, oh, I'm a J.O., you're a serial entrepreneur. I'm actually more of a um, parallel line entrepreneur. Everything's still running and everything's still uh, working together. And so we started uh, Pioneer Millworks, which was a reclaimed and sustainably harvested wood company, partly because I wanted stable, sustainably harvested wood timbers for myself, you know, and for the new energy works. And, but what clearly occurred to us is that we also needed to create markets for the offcuts of those reclaimed timbers or their timbers that we were milling. And so we became new pioneer millworks which makes flooring and siding and all sorts of things like shoshubiban siding, things like that from both reclaimed, but also sustainably harvested uh, certified forests. Uh, and so, and then after a while, I walked into a house that we had designed and, and uh, done a lot of work for, for a builder who, um, 
who had gone to like Home Depot and bought those, those spindly little uh, newels and, and, and balustrade. And, and I thought, ah, oh, that's not what this should look like. And so we started a stair business. And that stair business led to, and, uh, led to uh, cabinets. And all. we call that business New Woodworks. And right now that employs 15 people doing super cool uh, custom woodworking and for not only our own projects, but other people as well. So there are all these businesses that are intertwined uh, and all from the same seed, which is wood, uh, which is um, environmental thoughtfulness and high craft. And they're all still going right now. We're about 160 people. Uh, we're situated both in Western New York and the Finger Lakes region of New York, as well as the Willamette Valley of uh, you know, Oregon. Got it. Got it. And I appreciate that uh, explanation. So New Energy Works came first, and that is the timber. Do you Are you a custom home builder, or do you focus only on the timber framing? Tell us, tell us a little bit about New Energy Works and the scope of work there. Sure. Well, we have what we call the five fingers of new energy works, um, architecture, engineering, uh, timber framing, the timber rights section. We do a certain amount of general contract when the stars align uh, for both the client and us and geography. I mean, if you can imagine, Todd, we we raise timber frames all over the country and, and frankly, in other countries as well, but we can't be general contractor everywhere. So we're only a general contractor uh, within an hour or so of our shops and so but we are a general contractor in that area and then the fine woodworking department i mentioned called new woodworks and then finally we have uh, uh we do high performance enclosures and we do that either for our own work but also for builders all over the east uh, mostly in the like the hudson valley or the finger lakes in that area we call that hpez which is stands for high performance made easier Hmm. What we're trying to do is we're trying to, you know, we get it that so many builders, I mean, there's a lot on your plate, there's a lot on their plate. And and to also to, to now suddenly understand what the FIAS rules, uh, passive house rules are, and, or how to actually get high performance or why, as an example, uh, controversially, uh, spray foam on site is terrible for the environment and there are options. You know, it's a lot to come down. To. And so we're trying to make it easier for people by uh, both educationally looking at uh, alternatives to enclosure systems, but also supplying those walls. And, you know, it's a, it's a business opportunity for us as well as part of our stated goals, our values. So those are the five little fingers of New Energy Works, which is you know, design, timber framing, general contracting, fine woodworking, and high-performance enclosures. I, I heard you use a term before we hit record, which was the, the, the term is triple bottom line. I think most, hopefully most business owners know what the bottom line means, but they, they might be intrigued by the term triple bottom line. Can you explain that? I can. Triple bottom line was a term coined in the 1990s, by a fellow who's I'm spacing out his name, but you can find him on Google. Um, but we've been a triple bottom line company from our inception. And what that means to people is that <clears throat> we give equal weight, like a three-legged stool, if you sit on a three-legged stool, the equal weight on all three legs of people, planet, and profit. So yeah, you gotta have a profit. No question about it. And, and we tend to be profitable. I will tell you that. Um, but it's just as important in, in, in our world that we care just as much about the planet. It's the only one we got. And the people involved. Now, it's not just the people that you might say, well, my coworkers who are people, but it's also the clients who are people. But it's also the community, uh, our local community, whatever your community might be. It might be your your uh, horseshoe club or your church uh, or your school, your kid's school. But it's also the community of the all the people on the earth. So for us, people, planet, and profit, all are important. And for those who are cynical about that, I can also argue that it's a good business decision because people want to work where they believe, uh, where, where they believe in. And it's easier to inspire your coworkers in our experience. 
if you've got an operation that isn't just about lining the owner's pockets. Oh, yeah, we've got a lot more work, which means you get to work harder and I get more money. You know, that, that's so old school. You know, these days people want to be part of the solution, not only the solution of how are they going to make a living, but the solution of working with people they care about and, and inspired by, but also the solution of climate change. They want that. You're going to get better people. You're going to get people who are more engaged. No doubt about it. You know, there's some great books out there. One of them is uh, uh, one that I love a lot. Uh, it's called uh, Leaders Eat Last. Mm-hmm. And it's about the, uh, you, you probably know that book, Todd. Um, Simon Sinek. It's about, uh, yeah, it's, it really basically is uh, referring to, and I'm not a big reader of, of uh, uh, I read history. I don't really read uh, too many of these business books, but that one's really inspiring. And what it talks about is in the military, how the uh, how the officers will stand aside and let their and let the private uh, eat first, and then they eat last. Um, you know that same sort of service leadership is pretty critical, and honestly, it's really good for everyone, all the way up and down the ladder. So that's that people area that can lead to good profit. Profit. I mean, you still need to be able to run a good business, of course, but. You know, there's, I often say, Todd, that there's no single silver bullet. You know, it's a, it's a thousand silver BBs when it comes to making all the right decisions you have to make all the time. And, you know, that's just one of them. You know, treat your people right. Give them something to believe in. Make it more about them than you. You know, these are all the people part of, of the business. And then the planet's obvious. We only got one. It's hurting. And those who still don't think it is just, you know, need to climb out from under their rock. It's as simple as that. So, uh, yes. How's that for answer of what triple bottom line is? Yeah. Great answer. One of the, one of the challenges that our clients have shared with us, the, the construction business owners that we work with their challenges. How do I articulate the mission of our business to our people? How do I get it? How do I convey what's 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 in here and what's in my heart to my people so they they understand the vision and they get on board with it? How how do you go about that in a practical way? Sure. We have a saying in our company, it's basically over communicate. Over communicate. So, you know, you asked in a practical way. We have a a, a monthly newsletter that goes out to everybody. And I try to actually get it so that the spouses get this too in the emails, you know. So what's happening lately? Where are we going? What jobs are cool? Whose birthday it is? Um, we're, we're, we're an ESOP, which we'll get to in a bit, I imagine. Uh, so, you know, what are the latest ownership news? Uh, that sort of a thing. So that's that's one, but that's only part of it. Uh, we have a daily, <laughs> we over communicate. It takes work. I'm just going to warn you about that one. So one of the things we do, and it's now been emulated by a, a, a handful of uh, progressive companies, we have what we call a day of business. And that is that every year we stop. Everybody stops, you know, even the even our uh, receptionist. Uh, uh, you know, we all stop and we gather for the day and we talk about business. You know, we talk about what it takes to be in business. You know, what is what are cost of goods sold? How are we doing versus uh, budgets? you know, what our uh, debt to equity ratios are. Uh, we teach the game of business. You know, there's this uh, Jack Stack wrote this amazing book uh, many years ago, The Great Game of Business, you know. And what he did is he, 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 he made it clear that people are hungry for knowledge. They're hungry for information. Otherwise, they're just going to fill in the gaps themselves. And so, you know, we have an open book policy. We've had an open book policy for 25 years. We share how we did as a company, what that means to them. Uh, we have a profit sharing program uh, and um, as well, but we also really try to push back a lot of that earnings back into better benefits. And each year we do a little better and we'll do a little better. Uh, so, so we do have this day of business, talk about business, talk about finances, talk about budgeting, but we also share all the jobs we do. You know, we're bi-coastal, so not every, and we're five or six different groups that are working. So not everybody knows what every other group is doing. So we just share, we share and share. Sometimes we'll bring in a special speaker or so, maybe talking about the lumber business or the, or, or, or all sorts of businesses. And then sometimes we'll actually break up into groups. And those groups could be everything from 
how to quit smoking, to how to drive a forklift. You'd be surprised at how many gals in the office want to learn how to drive a forklift. You know, it's kind of fun. And, and to uh, how to get your kids to college, to, you know, how to identify wood, uh, what are the different wood species, and, you know, so we'll break up into various groups. You can sign up for something. And then at the, at night, we bring in some food trucks and throw axes at targets. Uh, so, uh, so, so that's that day of business. It's a celebration, but it's information sharing. Or over communicating, and I've never had anybody at the end of that day go, "Wow, that was boring." That was boring. You know, people buy it. People want to know what's going on. Now that we're bi, bi- coastal, we actually have to have one on each coast, mm-hmm. so that can be uh, tiring. But we, uh, but it's invigorating at the same time. A lot of work goes into it. Yeah, and uh, you know, without a doubt, and if anybody were to go onto our website, you'll see quite a powerful communication and and marketing team. I'm blessed with amazing. Uh, co-workers in that department who really want to share the story. It really is. I mean, you have to have good stuff to share. You know, if we did really ugly work, it probably wouldn't (laughs) show as well, but we don't do ugly work. And so, you know, we share that story. We share the story of our values. We share the story of our co-workers, but also our work and our clients. So, you know, we change our postcard of the day every day. That can be really a Dickens. Yeah. But we're always have a new thing there. And of course we're, active on social media so so the practical is you've got to invest in communication and you got to want to communicate i wrote a i write a newsletter every month to everybody it doesn't have to be long but uh but it has to be from the heart and it has to be information that they care about i heard you say that you like to include the spouses on the newsletter distribution list some people might be curious or maybe even opposed to that idea. Why do you like to include the spouses in that? Well, that's a great question. Why would anybody be opposed? I don't know. I don't know. I, I find that, I, so the day of business, you know, or, or, our, or our Christmas party or something, I mean, I, these spouses are powerful people. I mean, they're a powerful part of the family. Why would they not want to know what's going on? But it is true. It is voluntary and not everybody, you know, buys into that. So I guess somebody out there might agree with that question. I don't really know. Um, for me, I, I, I have very good relations and, and, and love a lot of these spouses. Last night I had dinner over at uh, one of my uh, co-workers' house, and, and uh, I've known his wife for now 10 years or so. I went to their wedding, and it's a warm and lovely feeling. So I say over-communicate. Don't be afraid. Yeah. People want to know, and spouses want to know. Yeah, yeah and, spouses and, are and, very, very important and, part of the, the equation. Hey, 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 send it to your mother and your mother-in-law, too. She might not treat you so bad at Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> Great idea. Great idea. So uh, as I understand it, a few years ago, you sold both companies to the employees of the companies in the form of an ESOP or an employee stock ownership plan. Let's talk about that a little bit. First of all, what what led you to make that move? What led you to make that transition? Sure. So I'm 67, and I've been doing this a long time. And uh, probably, oh, I, I bet you as long as 15 years ago, I started thinking about what does that future look like? And, you know, 15 years ago, as you might remember, somewhere around then, the 2008 occurred. And... <clears throat> no thought of anything other than survival for many construction companies during that time occurred. So while I said I started thinking about it 15 years ago, I'm going to amend that and actually say I started thinking about it 20 years ago. And we started to talk as a group, as a leadership group, as a employee group, as to what might this look like? And then that came to a dead stop at 2008 uh, uh, when all we were on was survival. And during that time, I'm super proud to say we didn't cut back on staff or salaries or even benefits, but of course, nobody got a raise for a while. And, and we did have some you know, uh, job sharing programs we had to go in. But we came out of that. We came out of the recession kind of roaring um, 2012 or so or 13, whenever you want to start saying, because we hadn't, we hadn't let everybody go. We, we powered through and ownership lost equity. But in the end, it, you know, we were much stronger for it. But no further conversation occurred during that time. And I was pretty thankful, you know, because in a in a in a boat in the middle of a crisis, you need just one hand on the tiller a lot of times. And 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 we weren't mature enough to have shared that responsibility. So 
you know, I had my hand on the tiller and we just powered through with great coworkers. But afterwards, you know, again, I started to think about it some more and realized that there's about three, maybe four ways that a company transitions. Uh, you either are carried out in a box because you stayed too long and died on the job and left a mess behind you. I don't recommend that one. I, uh, you can sell it to a third party. And that might be oftentimes the best and only option for a lot of your listeners. Uh, but that is filled with uh, problems, particularly one uh, company like ours, which was quirky and spread out and, and all of that we really relied on individuals throughout the company to make sure that it was working well at that point we were bi-coastal i was living three thousand miles away from the you know the bigger part of the company and so a third party my instincts tell me would have made a mess of it it just instincts um and we see that a lot mathematically a lot of third party buys still work uh sometimes you have a uh, key key uh key staff that you can sell it to which can often work whether through actual or phantom stock uh, which that can work. Or you can think about uh, democratization of the workplace. And that shows up in a few different ways. You know, in small businesses, that might be, uh, uh, again, a, a key employee situation or or in certain cases, worker-owned cooperatives, which is continuing to gather great steam. And a number of my friends in smaller businesses are looking at that pretty seriously. One of my closest friends uh, uh, is a, wrote the book on it in some ways. He didn't write the only book, but, you know, he's a national uh, national leader, and that is John Abrams, who used who is founder of South Mountain Company and wrote the book, The Companies We Keep. I highly recommend it. And I think uh, you can find him on abramsandangel.com right now. Uh, but anyway, look up John Abrams. There's a lot of good information he's handling. He's helping smaller businesses turn things, turn into uh, workers on cooperative. In our case, uh, we were really probably t potentially too big for a worker's own cooperative. Uh, and, and it wasn't really our, it wasn't who we are necessarily uh, to spread out. And, and, and I, I was looking for other options. And the ESOP or Employee Stock Ownership Plan, as you um, said, is an amazing program. And as far as I know, unique in the world. And as far as I also know, unique in the uh, fact that it's uh, bipartisan uh, support in Congress, if you can believe that, that's, a, that's something that's hard to say these days, um, but it continues to get bipartisan support because the right likes it because it's a powerful economic engine, uh, employee ownership. The left likes it because the workers get a piece of the action. And those are, that's really simplistic, but um, you know, that's sort of you know, philosophically uh, why is still such a strong bipartisan support, and um, and what it is is it's a tax incentive to the selling party. In this case, it was me to an ESOT, an employee stock ownership trust, uh, that speaks in the language or uh, speaks in the uh, for the people who are part of that trust, which is the employees. And, and so what I did is um, I sold it in two tranches or slices, first to 30%, uh, which is um, which sort of so we could get our fingers in, our, our toes in it and understand how it's working, all that. And then this last year, uh, December 31st of 2022, we, became, we then took the next step to 100% employee. So I am no longer the owner. I am an owner, along with, you know, 160 of my co-workers and actually it's, that's not accurate you have to uh, be in the company for a certain amount of time to become vested you know, there's a six-year vesting period 20 percent per year that sort of thing but um, and you have to work in the company a hundred sorry excuse me a thousand hours in the year previous to be eligible to start the vesting process that sort of stuff but yeah it's it, we are now 100 percent employee owned which is so thrilling for me going back to people as part of the important ways to run a business, one of the three legs of the triple bottom line. Now these folks are actually owners and that, that manifests itself in two important ways. One is that they are acquiring equity 
in the venture so that when they retire or leave, they now have a larger nest egg than they had before. Sometimes extremely large, I'll be honest. If if you're in an ESAP for 25 years and the ESAP does well, you can leave a millionaire without a doubt. And so that is good. And then the other way it manifests itself, at least theoretically done well, is that you know people who own something take better care of it. That's the theory. Uh, and, and if you over communicate and if you share your visions and listen to your coworkers and you know help them see the value in their newly acquired organization, then that happens. It really just happens. Um, I like to say we were already pretty sort of had an employee uh, mentality. Uh, excuse me, an uh, employee-owned mentality, uh, an ownership mentality. Otherwise, I couldn't have moved 3,000 miles away from the larger part and, and, uh, and, and still had as successful an effort as we had. But, you know, that's okay to have a, a, a ownership mentality, but to actually be an owner, you know, it's sort of like going to the grocery store with an with a, with a attitude of money. Well, that's not quite. You actually have to have the money to get your groceries. So in this way, you know, you, uh, my coworkers now are going to have the money to retire. And, and we still have a 401k. So we now have two methods of, you know, saving for retirement for people. Uh, and as they see this, their stake grow, there theoretically is a positive loop feedback. So I love it. Democratization of the workplace. It's good, for my, good for my people. Good for the bottom line. Am I missing anything? I don't think so. It would seem like, well, <clears throat> I, I worked in an ESOP for five years and it it created a bit of stickiness because if you were contemplating leaving the company, then you were walking away from the growth of your stock in the company and what you owned. And also it meant going from being an employee owner to being an employee. Now, when I transitioned out, I went to start my own business. And so I didn't really deal with that. Um, a lot of times I wish I had stayed with that company, quite frankly. I I saw I, I saw a few very small downsides to being in an ESOP. I'm curious, are there any downsides or concerns people should be aware of if they're contemplating transitioning to an ESOP? Sure. As with everything, you know, there's there are um, give and take. And in this case, cost of an ESOP is high. Uh, and, and so I really caution uh, your listeners that if you're not large enough to carry the first, the actual creation of the ESOP costs and then the yearly maintenance, which is not just which is not uh, just uh, uh, your own internal time, which can be a lot, but you're also you've hired a, a third-party administrator, you've hired a legal trustee as required by the laws, and um, you you have to have a valuation, an independent valuation every year. You know those costs can be quite high. In our case, each tranche or step was certainly two hundred thousand dollars, and uh, and our yearly maintenance costs are certainly $50,000. Uh, so, you know, you have to really want to do that. There are additional challenges too. Uh, one of them is uh, the what's called the repayment obligation requirements, which means you have to be able to be ready to buy back stock from people who retire or, or leave or face major uh, legal ramifications like jail. Um, mm -hmm. So, you, you really do need to make sure that you are saving enough money to pay back people as they retire. So what we do is we do actuarial tables and literally trace a plan for various retirements on certain assumptions. Uh, we can be specific, like uh, Joe's going to retire when he's 65. We know that, so let's plan on that now, five years ahead of time, or theoretically three more people whose names we don't know yet will retire or, or uh, you know, Sam's going to leave, you know, or the theoretical Sam's going to leave. So, so you're always uh, planning on making sure you are liquid enough to be able to do the buyback of the stock. You know, buying back the stock can be a good thing because then you have it, you know, for more for other people, but you have to be able to do it. There's no, 
uh, once somebody leaves, they have the right to have their stock paid back, uh, bought back. Uh, so that's an uh, important area. And the, the, the planning and the um, paperwork for that is critical. The other one is sort of interesting. I bet you many of your listeners don't have a really aggressive or solid board of directors. You know, for me, I was the sheriff, uh, the, you know, the cow- I'm, I consider myself a cowboy entrepreneur. I ran this place like the sheriff for 30 years or so. <laughs> you know, it's, I mean, sure, you, we, we're collaborative and I live a long way away, but the bottom line is you know, I'm just the sheriff. Well, I'm no longer the sheriff. I'll tell you that. I now work at the pleasure of the board, and the board is, for the first time in my life, a powerful board of coworkers and independent, highly skilled, intelligent, compensated board members who uh, who hold my feet to the fire that I just assume not, not have it held to the fire every day. So uh, that's a change. That's different, and that's interesting. So now I am no longer the sheriff. I'm a CEO, or what I like to say is the marshal federal marshal. You know, I have to follow the rules and the old school share. And um, and so I work at the pleasure of the board. And, you know, it's it's different. <laughs> so I recommend it. I, I think it's amazing. Uh, we're a better company for it. I'm sometimes stressed about it. But that's small business too. Even as a sheriff, you're stressed. So yeah. yeah, it's just different. So those three things are the biggest differences, I'd say. One of the things that you have to realize is an ESOP, because it is a tax protected entity, you use tax savings to buy out ownership specifically to be really blunt, or to buy out people who are leaving the company in that. And, and, and you do, you save a lot on taxes. It's an amazing tax program, but it can also therefore be a tax dodge. There are, there are, every time you get a tax haven, you get, you get uh, greed and corruption. It's just a fact. And so uh, this is highly regulated by the Department of Labor because it falls under the ERISA laws, which protect um, people's uh, retirement and savings. And it also is well, well examined by the IRS because, you know, they're kind of pissed that you're no longer uh, paying taxes. So it's highly regulated. And that's not for everybody. But for companies, 20 million, 30 million and up. Uh, uh, I think it's a really interesting and very powerful way to consider transitioning as as owners. Yeah, I'm curious. I've worked with and been around folks who've transitioned from being the the sheriff to either stepping back away from the business. Maybe a second generation is coming up, or they've sold the business, and they've had aspirations that it's going to be fantastic, and they've been surprised by how they've. How, how tough the transition has been. I'm curious, what were some of the things that that you dealt with as you took the the sheriff's star off and and handed control over to the board of directors or as you went through this transition? And maybe there weren't any, but I'm just curious if there's anything that people who are considering making a transition like this might want to be prepared to deal with. So... Uh... I would suggest that the phrasing is, what are you still dealing with? You know, again, this is pretty fresh for us and, and, and there's a lot of learning going on. Again, there's also a, so, so there's a couple of, there's some practical issues and then there are some emotional issues. Hmm. That's going to be true in any transition. So I'm under, uh, like I run the West coast out here as well as I'm the CEO of the overall enterprise, which includes all of the various companies and uh, both coasts. And that's ex- that can be ex- exhausting. And and now that my CEO responsibilities are increasing due to requirements of the ESOP uh, uh, structure and the board, I am vigorously turning over my West Coast management responsibilities. And that, you know, for those, <laughs> many of your listeners know that they are the boss because that's all they know. And it's not always easy to say, oh, well, I think I'll just be quiet and let this play out. Or, oh, so-and-so really has this. And that's not exactly the way I would do it, but right on. Um, and once you train yourself to say those things in your head and force yourself to understand that that's the right way, then it's a good thing. It's a gift. But you know, like a lot of things, it takes a little bit of training and thought uh, to go along with that. You know, one of the I've got a lot of sayings, and one of them is, hey, we've all heard that the problem with labor is management. But I've added two tenets to that. The problem with management is ownership, 
And often we owners have to be owners, otherwise we'd get fired. A lot of entrepreneurs are good at rainmaking, are good at you know new ideas and, and just generally creating that edge, that excitement uh, to a business. But we're not necessarily as good at process. And we're not necessarily good at uh, developing a linearity to logic. And, and some are and some aren't. It's not my area of strength. You know, we have a lot of different uh, fun areas that we're working on, but, you know, all of them need more process. All of them need more organization. And that's not my area of strength. You know, I'm an entrepreneur who's grown this business. My next generation of management has to have that skill. They've got to be better at process. Luckily, they are. You know, it's natural to hire your uh, uh, the person who isn't exactly like you a lot of times. And so I've hired you know, the people who work with me now on second generation leadership, you know, are better at process than I am. So we're seeing that. But one of the things I was saying, Todd, and so critical, is that <clears throat> the second generation leadership, while better at process, also has to not lose that entrepreneurial edge. And that's a tricky part of the transition. You know, how do you really instinctually get in the car and drive seven hours to close a deal because you knew that was the right thing? You know, that sort of entrepreneurial edge. And so um, balancing the second generation skills with the original entrepreneurial edge, entrepreneur's edge, is, is always the challenge. And one of the reasons why second gen uh, uh, organizations don't always make it. I'm curious, as, uh, as you look around um, and look at other construction business owners, what, what are some of the biggest mistakes well, let me let me put it this way. When you look around at other businesses, how do you you see them designing their businesses to fail? Nobody does this intentionally, but when you look at their business, do you do you how do you see them designing their business to fail without them, if at all? So, I'm not sure about the without them. Uh, although I think we did discuss that in the various ways of uh, how you can transition out of a company. Um, if, but what I mostly see and where I struggle is owners who use the first person singular too much. Hmm. It, they think it's about me and I and, and their coworkers see that it's about me and I when he, when he or she talks. And I think that that's a problem. You know, for some, not so much, and that's great, and I don't, you know, that's fine. But oftentimes, it's hard to keep good coworkers if uh, it's hard to keep good coworkers when they don't see a future or, or they don't see themselves in the picture. So I think that me and I and um, both emotionally, like, okay, I'm going to make these decisions. It's all about, you know, my vision, but also it's all about, you know, rewards if, if you know keep all the money you're not going to keep good people so sometimes it's just about greed honestly yeah yeah a couple of things come to mind uh, i heard a, a saying recently that people lose hope when they run out of future <laughs> that's a great so, saying so uh, when they look at your business if you're the business owner kind of being sarcastic there if they don't see any future they lose hope and they go somewhere else um, and the other thing that comes to mind is I think it was Jim Collins talked about the one of the problems with with uh, business owners is they are the genius with a thousand helpers. Like they have all the ideas, they're the mad scientists, and they just surround themselves with helpers. And they're just there with an extra set of hands to help them. And I, I think that that is a pervasive mindset. It's like it's I'm the builder, I'm the contractor. I'm the creative genius and you're here to help me. And that's not a mindset. That's not a vision. Many people are going to get excited about long-term. Yeah, I agree. That's, that's really good. So your job is now the CEO. And I think a lot of people would say, I want to be the CEO, but if they were asked, okay, what does a CEO do? I don't know that they could articulate that. So what, what are some of the top, priorities for you as the CEO? Yeah. Todd, I'm not sure I can tell you what a CEO does either. It, <laughs> um, you know, I have to laugh. Uh, we never allowed C-suite uh, uh, um, 
titles in our business until very recently, until this transition to 100%. Mm. And now we have a CEO, a COO, and a, CF, a CFO. And it's like, wow, that's a lot of Cs. Um, but there is some truth to that. And it is an important. Uh, it is important. There are many theories on the dichotomy between the CEO and the CEO, for instance, or organizational charts and accountability charts. You know, we use a program of, a, of accountability and organization in our company called EOS, started by Gino Wickman. You know, everybody's heard what you should hear of him, but I don't agree with a lot of it. I dislike it. And it's so interesting because in, in all of his books, which, by the way, you only need to read one because they're all the same book with different titles. But, uh, you know, when you read the when you read his stuff, he says, the entrepreneur is going to hate this system. <laughs> well, he's right. I hate the system. It's about ritual and dumbing shit down. And, um, but it's handy from an accountability standpoint. And my coworkers, who I admire tremendously, say, yeah, yeah, I get it. You don't like it, but it helps me stay organized and accountable. And wow. You know, one of my uh, uh, one of my uh, mentors once said to me, I don't care what system you use, Jonathan, just use a system, you know. And so in that example, the CEO is the visionary and the COO is the implementer. I don't agree with that at all. Um, I think that's problematic. You know, that's that puts that CEO up on some sort of pedestal separated from the day to day. So that's one of the many things I don't like about the EO system. That is a one of the definitions of what a CEO is supposed to do: outward facing, uh, visionary, um, idea person, uh, rainmaker. Um, so, and the and then the COO is the person who gets it done. That's so simplistic; like, it just drives me nuts. Um, because a good entrepreneur has got his hands right there in the dishwasher with everybody else. A good CEO is able to, like, for instance, I still go and help on timber frame raisings. Hmm. You know, and it helps me to stay sensitive to what we're doing. And it's exhausting because I'm getting older and I try to stay in good shape. But wow, those young kids can outwork me now. And that's embarrassing to say it, but it's true. Uh, so, you know, but I'm still out there. And that's, you know, that's important. So anyway, blah, blah, blah. Um, there's a whole lot of definitions on what CEOs do and what COOs do. CFOs, by the way, most com most of your listeners don't need one. You know, that's really just a high level concept, which is a costly level of a, of a, a, a of C suite member. You know, a good accounting manager is probably what most people just need. But now that we're becoming um, fully uh, employee owned with responsibilities of the ESOP, and we do need that CFO level position, which is mostly about making sure systems and future planning and financing is taken care of. So um, I'm probably not doing a very good job of answering your question, Todd, because there isn't a great answer. Every company needs to understand the options and choose their path. And um, like my COO is a wonderful coworker of mine, and he's got some skills that I don't have. Um, but he doesn't have all that it takes to be a CEO yet in his life. I, I, my guess is he will at some point. But, you know, he doesn't quite have all the, but I don't have all his skills either. So it's really a partnership. In fact, I call him my partner. And I get uh, I get pushback from my, my board sometimes. It says, well, you shouldn't call him your partner because he reports to you. Like, Screw that. You know, so I'd say dig in. Find out what's right for your organization. But the simplistic answer is the CEO is more outward facing and, uh, and ideas and supporting the people who are getting the day to day done. Yeah, that I, I agree with you. One of my one of my issues with the, the traction approach is probably more generally, I have a problem with the cookie cutter approach that says, here's a template take this template, fill in the blanks. Here's, here's an SOP for every type of construction business, or here's an SOP even for a custom home builder. Uh, that just doesn't work. And I think one of the fundamental problems there is it doesn't, it's not about the words on paper or the accountability chart. I, I think the key to implementation is who's involved in developing that. That's what we found in our work. So I think the key is have some frameworks, but f dig in, Find what works for you, make it your own, and it's probably going to look different than everybody else, and that's okay. 
but I I would advise people to avoid just trying to use a cookie cutter approach and and shove their round peg of a business into a square hole that just doesn't fit. That's just going to be frustrating. And, you, and Todd, for clarification, uh, you said the traction approach. Your clients might or your listeners might not know that that's Gina Whitman's most right. famous book in the EOS process. Yep. Yep. Yeah. The EOS or EOS approach, it's very popular. And we use components of that. We found them to be successful. But uh, I, I think I think a lot of it is it's a little excessive in my mind. But maybe that's because I'm kind of a visionary myself. Some people may love that stuff. So let me ask you a couple of quick hit questions here. I want to be uh, cognizant of your time. I heard you mention that you interviewed a potential future team member. Let me ask you this. what What's one thing you look for when you're interviewing a potential employee or team member? What's the number well, one I'll give thing you, you're looking for? Yeah, I'll give you the cliche answer. And as my English teacher in eighth grade told me, cliches can become cliches because they are so true. Uh, and the cliche answer is you're looking for somebody that fits in and is smart. Those two things are important. I can teach somebody how to uh, do three-dimensional modeling. Uh, I can teach somebody even how to sharpen a chisel. I cannot teach attitude and intelligence. So you know, those are big things right there. And then, and then after that, it all kind of falls into place. You, clarity on the role. That's not something that's as natural for me. But as I continue to see, particularly some of these younger people, they, I'm told they need clarity. I don't know why. I never had any. But, you know, clarity is important um, on the role. Uh, and so I look at that. Um, in our case, you know, we're looking at our future partners, so to speak, our future coworkers who are co-owners. So, you know, that's kind of a big deal. Um, so that's an important part of our discussion. That's hard to do, uh, particularly with younger people who you, you know, kind of really doubt that they'll be there in 30 years, it's just mathematically, actuarially, or, you know, the numbers are against you. So it's hard to think about that in that way, but you ought to. So yeah, it's, it, a lot of it has to do with that sparkle. You know, one of the questions I ask is, if you were to paint the picture of your next perfect job, what would that picture look like? And it's interesting because it's kind of a disarming way to ask. And and you'd think that they would just pander because it's kind of a lob, but people go off in these long, interesting thought processes that tells a lot about them when you ask that question. And um, so intelligence and 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 and, and attitude and and uh, uh, of course, you know we. We tend to also look for people who aren't racist and misogynist, but you know that's another <laughs> story. Yeah. Let me ask you this question. This is one of my favorite questions to ask. What is one thing you believe to be true about business that some might think is a little unconventional or maybe even crazy? Dude, that's a lob for me. The most important thing about business is it's our only hope. Business is a change agent that can make the difference. When Exxon says, you know, in 1980, oh, I'm well aware that we are creating climate change, but we better hide that. That's the opposite of hope. If Exxon in 1980 had said, we see climate change coming, we're part of the problem, let's help solve this thing back then, we would not be in the pickle that we are right now. Mm -hmm. Business is a huge opportunity for progressive change throughout all levels of society, including environmental concerns, people concerns, the wealth gap, which is causing all sorts of troubles in the U.S. right now and in other countries as well. You know, so, yeah, it's just a powerful, powerful tool. If somebody came to you, you had coffee with them, and they said, Jonathan, I own a construction business, and I'm planning to scale it up. I want to grow my team. I want to take on bigger projects. I want to grow my business. And you could ask them one question that they really need to think about. What would that question be? Sure. Simplistically, I'd say why, you know, but that's just the, that's just the first question you need to ask. Um, and, and then the other one is, have you figured out your exit strategy? <laughs> it, you really want to start planning that well ahead. I started a uh, triple bottom line uh, a networking group up here in the Pacific Northwest. I belong to a triple bottom line networking group in uh, New England from our New York operation. 
and it's been really powerful. It's out of the New England, uh, sorry, Northeast Sustainable Energy Association's uh, umbrella, but there was nothing like that out here. So I started one of my own bang self. What I'm asking people is, what does it look like? What does your company look like in 10 years and 20 years? And people are like, oh, I guess I hadn't really thought about that. I got payroll next week to think about it. Got to get that. But boy, time flies. And so start thinking about ahead, about transition, what you want your company to be and uh, who you want it to look like in, in 10 years. It doesn't mean I'm not asking for strategic planning, like as in let's you know nail this out, just a general sense. And so that's really a question that we ask. Yeah. Why are you in business? What is it going to look like? Yeah, and I think the how are you going to exit your business is a really big question. A lot of people, they're focused on how do I get into it, but they also need to be thinking about how am I going to how am I going to get out of this thing so that I, hopefully it's not I get carried out in a box as you said, or <laughs> hopefully it's not. Well, I'm just going to turn the lights off and and uh, slide the keys across the desk to the the landlord or whoever bought the building and just shut it all down but yeah those are really good questions yeah yeah there is equity to be gotten whether you sell it to the team whether you sell it to an esop you know you've you've worked hard you've taken a lot of risks you spent a lot of Saturdays and Sundays away from your family trying to figure stuff out Lord knows it's a sacrifice um, so yeah I I think it's kind of a it's kind of a tragedy that there right now. There are hundreds of people, hundreds of construction business owners, if at least hundreds, who are, are going to shut their business down in 2024. And all of that wealth, all of that equity, all that value is just going to go away because they didn't have a plan to transfer it. Meanwhile, there are hundreds of- 10 years ago. 10 years ago, they didn't have a plan for today. Yeah. And it's too late, Right. And meanwhile, there's this other group of people. There are hundreds of aspiring entrepreneurs thinking, I want to start my own business. And they're willing to go beat their head against the wall and take all of this risk on to start a business. It's it's a tragedy that we can't connect those two groups hmm. of people to be That's able to, to transition, to be able to say, hey, I'm ready to I have a business in in Minneapolis. And there's somebody in that area who wants to take over a business that could create some sort of overlap, some sort of platform to transfer that, that wealth and institutional knowledge and reduce the failure rate of construction businesses. I, I just think it's a tragedy that the, those two groups of people are disconnected, but that's a whole, probably a whole other podcast episode. Yeah, Todd, it sounds like you've got a new business starting. Go for it. <laughs> so a couple of rapid fire questions for you. Are you a, uh, do you prefer books or movies? No, neither. I love them both. I No, both. I love okay. them both. I can tell you all about the latest movies I've watched and I can tell you what books I'm reading. So. Okay. So what is, what is, what's one book you would highly recommend everybody go check out and one movie you recommend everybody go check out? So any book about uh, Winston Churchill hmm. uh, is, uh, he's a fascinating historical figure who is amazing. And so just on that note, coincidentally, The Darkest Hour, Gary Oldman's uh, rendition of uh, Winston Churchill at the beginning of World War II was amazing. But here's a here's a movie for you that uh, if somebody just needs something to feel good about, uh, Sweet Beans. It's a Japanese movie I just saw about uh, about a, uh, a pastry shop and a woman with uh, a leprosy. It really is a great movie. It makes you feel right. I like it. The Japanese just have a sensibility, a visual sensibility that is just not got. Sweet beans. Mm. Sweet beans. And you're in Portland, Oregon right now. Is that right? I am, yeah. What is, if somebody visits Portland, what is the restaurant they should visit? So I like Andina. Uh, it's the best Peruvian food outside of Peru and, and actually better than most inside Peru, by the way. Um, so that's pretty amazing if you needed one. Okay. Uh, if you like If you like sushi... Uh, ba uh, bamboo sushi is the first and most powerful, fully sustainably harvested sushi uh, restaurant in America. There are others like it, but they're, they've cut the wake and uh, Marine Stewardship Certification and uh, and Seafood Watch Certification and incredible food. Good cocktails, okay. too. Nice. And where's your favorite place to travel? Wow. 
I am well traveled. And so I, again, it's like, I got a bunch of them, but the Alvord desert of uh, uh, Southeast Oregon, which is two people per square mile and unbelievable off-road motorcycling is probably uh, right up there at the top. Very cool. Last question. If people want to follow what you're up to, connect with you, apply to be a coworker at one of your businesses, where are the best places for them to go, Jonathan? Yeah, you can find me at our website under our, our people section. Um, and uh, it's just newenergyworks.com or pioneermillworks.com. You know, they'll, they'll all get us uh, to the same place. And that's, that's probably the best. Of course, we're on all the social medias, which I don't actually do a very good job of, but my coworkers do, thankfully. Um, but yeah, newenergyworks.com, pioneermillworks.com. I'm Jonathan, J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N at either of those. Great stuff. Well, Jonathan, this has been fantastic. Thanks so much for taking the time to do this. And I really appreciate it. Thanks so much, man. Todd, you said 45 minutes. We're at like 65 minutes. You, you got to pay me overtime now. I know. I owe you. I owe you. <laughs> well, I look forward to meeting you someday in person. Absolutely. And best Thank of luck to all of you. Best of luck to all of your listeners. Good stuff. Thank you. And hope you enjoyed that episode. Be sure to check out the show notes for more details over at constructionleadingedge.com forward slash podcast. And if you get value out of this podcast, would you do me a favor? Would you please leave a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify? And if you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe. If you own a construction business and you feel stuck or you feel like you're spending too much time in day-to-day -day firefighting, maybe dealing with all of the problems, if everything's stuck in your head, or if you just don't feel like you have time or energy to work on your business because you feel like you're stuck working in it, if you want your business to run without you so you can take a vacation or maybe to be able to sell your business one day, or if you want, just frankly want the business to survive if something happens to you, then there are four crucial systems that you need to have in place. Number one, if you're a home builder, remodeler, or a commercial general contractor, you have to get paid for estimates. Those free estimates are killing your bottom line, sucking the life out of you. And you can get all the tools you need to get paid for estimates, the templates, sales scripts, pricing guidance, and let's face it, the confidence that you need. You can get all of that for free right now over at constructionleadingedge.com forward slash start. You'll get the entire Get Paid for Estimates Masterclass. Go to constructionleadingedge.com forward slash start. You can get all of that for free. The second crucial system is that you need to design your business for the future. You need to establish the major functions of your business and the results that each function is accountable for. You need to have clearly defined roles and responsibilities. This is the foundation of every successful business and the best way to do that is to design your accountability chart for the future. Number three, you need to design and document your process to nail the handoff from the office to the field. This is a very disciplined and documented process that maps out every step of the pre-construction process. Look, companies that are good construction companies are actually good pre-construction companies. They're good pre-construction companies. And when you design your nail the handoff process and you have this in place, this is gonna eliminate 80% of the profit bleeds and the schedule delays and chaos on your job sets. And you'll also need to learn the secret sauce for getting your team to actually implement and follow a process. Number four, the fourth crucial system are the leadership systems that your team will use to convert your goals into reality. Look, somebody needs to be planning tomorrow's work today. Someone needs to be doing a two week look ahead. Someone needs to be establishing the most important things for the next six to eight weeks. And you need to be having regular team meetings that are actually functional. Those are your leadership systems. And if you would like our help putting those crucial systems in place in your business so that your business can run without you, so you can get out of day-to-day -day firefighting and take that firefighting firefighter hat off. Or if you want to be able to sell your business one day, here's the next step. Go to constructionleadingedge.com forward slash apply and schedule a free business evaluation call with our team. 
On that call, we're gonna do a few things. We'll help you uncover the real root causes of your problems. Number two, help you get clear on your objectives that you want to accomplish. And then number three, to map out a plan to make it a reality. We'll also share with you some of the things that our construction business owner clients are doing to accomplish their goals and solve the problems that you're probably dealing with. And then if you're a fit, it looks like we have a good mutual fit. We'll discuss our systematize your construction business program. So to schedule your free business evaluation, head on over to constructionleadingedge.com forward slash apply, A-P-P-L-Y. Hey, thanks for listening. I'll see you next time.